Dear Rebecca, Mrs. President, dear friends and colleagues, it is a great pleasure and an honor to present the Douglas Winsco Lecture at the annual general meeting of the British Lycan Society in 2021. Forty-nine years ago, I became a member of the British Lycan Society, and therefore I want to express my sincere gratitude for help and inspiration and encouragement by members past and present. For example, by David Hawksworth, who kindly corrected the clumsy English style of my first publications in the Lycanologies from 1978 onwards. In the early 1970s, I went to see Heinrich Zoller, an expert in palynology and the history of botany, the only professor at the Botanical Institute of the University of Basel, and asked if I could do a PhD thesis project in his institute and what the title could be. He said, you are an independent person, do what you like. As I had become interested in lichens already as a teenager, I decided to investigate lichens in my PhD thesis. However, ever since Simon Schwendener had left the University of Basel in 1876, where he had described lichen symbiosis. No one had been studying lichens at this institute. Therefore, I could not count on scientific guidance or support for my thesis project, but enjoyed full scientific freedom. My problem was to find a scientifically interesting topic. I tried this and that, investigated the reliability of lichenometry on moraines in the Swiss Alps, together with Lawrence King, a PhD student of the Geographical Institute of the University of Basel. In spring 1972, just by chance, I fortunately met Professor Aino Hensen, the international renowned lichenologist from the University of Marburg in Germany. We both were at the same time in the marine biology station of Roscoff in Brittany. I introduced myself and I know immediately realized how isolated I was with my lichenological studies. Like a mother hen, she took me under her wings, took me on field trips in Brittany, invited me to her lab and home in Marburg and said, you have to become a member of the British Lichen Society and of the International Association of Lichenologists. I remember how excited I was when I got the first issue of the Lichenologist. On the tea table in Aino's home were the last issues of the scientific journals which she had subscribed and reprints of recent publications she had got. There I saw for the first time electron microscopy images of non-lichenized and few lichenized fungi. I was absolutely excited, especially about the fine structure of the assay and of ascospore formation, and decided this is what I want to investigate in lichen forming ascomycetes. There was a large body of published light microscopy data on ASCO structure in lichenized fungi. 
I hope that ultra structural studies might facilitate the interpretation of some of the complex ASCA structures as described by the French school around Marius Chapeau. Here are some ASCA's tips of non lichenized foundy. Our institute had no equipment for electron microscopic investigations. I could learn the preparative techniques in the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Basel and use their infrastructure for my thesis project. However, the preparative protocols as used in this lab for studies on trypanosoma and other human pathogens did not work with the very thick walled assay of lichen forming fungi, nor was I successful with the methods as used in non lichenized ascomycetes. It took me a long time with trial and error until I got the first decent micrographs of developmental stages of the ascus of Fustia stellaris. You see here very young ascus, a crosse with the two nuclei, and the young ascus with thin wall in the apical region. However, the longer I worked at the transmission electron microscope, the more I liked this technique, which gave access to completely new dimensions. The fine structure of the ascus of the Lecanora type and its variability in different Lecanoraceae and the ascospore formation, which you can see here in this ascus, where you have fusing little saccules, probably from the endoplasmic reticulum, which form a membrane pack which invaginates around nucleate portions of cytoplasm. This is a, a very fascinating uh, phenomenon of free cell formation. Now, these studies from ascosporogenesis to mature ascospore and ascostehiscence were the results which I presented in my PhD thesis. After the th thesis project, I continued with studies on ASCO structure and ascosporogenesis and investigated conidiogenesis with combined transmission and scanning electron microscopy techniques. At the second International Mycological Congress in Tampa, in Florida, in 1977, I had a chance to present this and some additional data. On the same evening, a long, very in interesting and fruitful discussion with Alan Beckett from the University of Bristol and his PH student Nick Reed were an absolute highlight for me. Alan Beckett with Brent Heath and David McLaughlin, author of An Atlas of Fungal Ultrastructure, here, encouraged me to continue. The second highlight of this Congress was the general lecture held by David Smith from the University of Bristol one of the founding members of British Lichen Society, with the title What can lichens tell us about real fungi? In this sophisticated and at the same time very humorous presentation, David analyzed the situation of lichenology and summarized the result of his team on physiology of lichen symbiosis in comparison with algae invertebrate symbiosis. 
David and his team had used the so-called inhibition technique. Discs of porcivently organized lichens were dissected along the algal layer and placed on an incubation medium, which contained glucose. The microbiont was allowed to absorb this carbon source and satisfy its requirement, which then should inhibit the uptake of photobiont-derived photosynthates. Radioactive 14 CO2 was added and the disc illuminated to allow algal photosynthesis. The assumption was the mobile carbohydrate, which is moving from the photobiont to the mycobiont, would then diffuse out into the incubation medium whence it can be collected and analyzed. In green algal lichens, the mobile carbohydrate turned out to be a sugar alcohol such as ribitol in Trebuxia, Cocomyxa and Myrmetia species, erythritol in Trentefolia or sorbitol in Hyalococcus or Stichococcus, but glucose in cyanobacterial lichens. In the fungal partner, the photobiont derived mobile carbohydrate was transformed into mannitol. However, the amount of photobiont derived mobile carbohydrates as detected with the inhibition technique was too low to satisfy the needs of the quantitatively predominant fungal partner of the lichen thallus. David Smith and his co-workers switched to other symbiotic systems with photoautotrophic partners such as algae invertebrate symbiosis, which are extremely common and widespread in freshwater and especially in marine ecosystems. In 1973, he wrote, of particular interest to lichenologists are the varieties of associations between algae and other heterotrophic organisms, especially invertebrates. After his general lecture and the long and very interesting discussion with David Smith, I decided to have a closer look at the microbiont photobiont interface in diverse lichens using combined electron microscopy techniques. Thanks to a teaching position in the cytology lab of the Institute of Plant Biology at the University of Zurich, I had access to outstanding equipment, including scanning and transmission electron microscopy with ultra-thin sectioning and freeze-edge technology. Ever since the discovery of lichen symbiosis by Schwendener in 1867, various light microscopy investigations of the contact site of microbiont and photobiont cells in lichens had been published, among others by the famous Italian botanist Eva Mameli, the mother of the Italian writer Italo Calvino. The most extensive comparative investigations of microbiont photobiont interactions were performed by Elisabeth Cermak and her student Anne Marie Plessel at the Institute, Botanical Institute of the University of Vienna. They described a wide range of haustorial types in green algal and cyanobacterial lichens and observed a correlation between morphological complexity of the thallus and haustorial type. The first electron microscopy studies of the microbiont photobiont interface in lichens were published in the second half of the 1960s 
among other space Vernon as Macham, Markalik Galun, and Elizabeth Teveling and their teams. In my own studies, I first focused on the improvement of pre preparative techniques. And soon I realized that we have to investigate not only the fine structure of the microbiont photobiont interface, but also the chemical composition of the green algal cell wall. Trebuxia species, the most common green algal photobionts of lichen forming ascomycetes, and Trentepolia species have cellulosic walls compar comparable to the walls of parenchymatous plant cells. Cellulose microfibrils making up the main part of this cell wall. Fungal house doria penetrate this cell wall in case of intracellular haustorium formation, as summarized here, but also in cases like this and the following examples where the fungal partner only formed an infection peg into the cell wall of the photobiont but did not pierce it. In the type 3, which is characteristic of uh, Parmeliaceae and Telogistaceae, the photobiont cell is even shifted in optimal position as regards to photosynthesis within the thallus by gr growing haustorial complexes of the microbiont. You see this type here. The mother cell wall of these Trebuxia cells is degraded, you can see here, the mother cell wall. Sorry. It disappears, and this is also visible in this thin section, the mother cell wall disintegrates and disappears. No haustoria at all were found in ASCO and Basidio lichens with unicellular green algae of the genera Cocomyxa and Elitochloris. Their wall comprises a thin, enzymatically non-degradable trilaminar outer wall layer. You can see it here. And these trilaminar wall layers are not disintegrating after autospore formation. They accumulate in the thallus in large numbers, as you see here and here. Or here, so thin remains being visible at the microbiont photobiont interface here. Uli Brunner, one of my first PhD students, carefully investigated this particular green algal cell wall type and characterized a sporopollenin like biopolymer in this trilaminar outer layer, and this explains why it was not enzymatically degraded. Today, this type of non-hydrolyzable algal cell wall biopolymer, which occurs in a wide range of cocoid green algae, is referred to as alginans. The same type of algal cell wall is found in chlorella photobionts of the freshwater zoelenterate Hydra viridissima, of the freshwater sponge Spongilla lacustris, and of freshwater protozoan such as Paramecium species. The heterotrophic exhabitant of this symbiosis probably wanted to eat 
it is unicellular algae that could not digest them because they are protected by the enzymatically non-degradable outer wall layer. You can see such uh, remains of, autos of uh, mother cell walls here, here, here. Such remains accumulate in vacuoles, which are then excreted. It is important not only to compare lichen symbiosis with algae invertebrate symbiosis, as recommended by David Smith, but also with mutualistic and parasitic fungal symbiosis with photoautotrophic partners. Biotrophic plant pathogen, such as rust fungi or powdery mildews, form lobate haustoria in close contact with the plasma membrane of the host cell. And so do orchid arbutoid and the very common arbuscular mycorrhizae, the latter form tree-like haustorial complexes in close contact with the pl plasma membrane of the host cell. I always wondered why the mycobiont photobiont interface in lichens is so simple. Why do this Mycobionts not form a large exchange surface with the plasma membrane of the photobiont. I soon realized that this might be due to the poikilohydrous water relations of lichens with their continuous fluctuations of water contents between saturation and desiccation. In freeze fracture preparations of hyphae of the medullary and algal layer in diverse lichens, I saw a very thin wall layer, actually a wall surface layer, with distinct rodlet pattern, which forms a hydrophobic discontinuity in the fracture plane. In ultra-thin sections, it was resolved as an electron-dense wall surface layer which covers fungal hyphae and photobiont cells in the taline interior. Hydrophobic wall surface layers with rodlet pattern have been described in aerial hyphae, especially conidiophores and conidia of non-lichenized fungi for the first time by Hess et al. in 1968. I was irritated to see this rodlet pattern and hydrophobic lining on the surface of hyphae in lichenized asco and basidium seeds. <coughs> this stratified thallus. And even on the surface of photobiont cells, the rodlet layer is spreading from the mycobiont to the photobiont cell wall surface. This applies not only for Trebuxia and, in, and Cocomyxa, but also for Nostoc photobionts in Peltigera species. You can see here. This is a freeze fractured view of the fungal hypha with rodlet layer and the gelatinous sheath of the Nostoc colony, which you can see here in a low temperature scanning micrograph. And the detail of this wall surface shows a distinct rodlet pattern. You can see here. So we have a very uh, interesting situation at the mycobiont photobiont interface, for example, here in a 
Parmelia species, the cell wall proper with the cellulosic microfibrils, uh, amorphous outer wall layer, which is then covered by the droplet layer, which itself can be obscured by material, probably secondary metabolites of fungal origin, which crystallize on the surface of this uh, hydrophobic surface layer, on the fungal partner, as well as on the algal cells. Now, In 1994, Han Wösten, PhD student of Jos Wessels at the University of Groningen, characterized this rotlet layer as hydrophobines, small secreted fungal proteins with low sequence homology, which self-assemble in vivo and in vitro to an amphiphilic film and spread over surfaces at the liquid-air interface. <coughs> Sorry. I could have embraced him when I read his papers, because this explained why the hydrophobic rotlet layer was spreading from the contacting fungal hypha over the wall surface of the photobiont cell. My skillful PhD students Sandra Scherer and Marcella Trembli characterized hydrophobins in various Xanthoria species and related Pelogistaceae and in the lichenized Basidiomyces dictionema glabratum. With immunocytochemical techniques, the site of hydrophobin gene expression was located in the hyphae of the medullary and algal layer in Xanthoria pietina, as you can see here, and in the lichenized basidiocarp of Dictionema glabratum, respectively. Recently, Mieko Kono and colleagues sequenced the whole genome of Usnea hakonensis and successfully resynthesized an early stage of its symbiotic phenotype using sterile cultures of both symbionts. The hydrophobin gene, as well as the polyketide ketide synthetase genes, were upregulated during the establishment of the symbiosis as compared to the sterile cultured mycobiont. The formation of a hydrophobic coat at the mycobiont photobiont interface is crucial for the functioning of the symbiotic interaction. What did these findings contribute to our understanding of lichen symbiosis? The, hydrophobin, the hydrophobic lining of the wall surfaces in the saline interior was the reason for the low amount of translocated photosynthates in experiments using the inhibition technique. The mobile carbohydrate was not diffusing out into the incubation medium, but was leaking out of cup ends of the hyphae. So the hydrophobic lining prevents the saline interior from getting waterlogged at high hydration levels. And it canalizes the fluxes of solutes from the thallus surface to the interior and vice versa during the drying drought stress situations. Water and dissolved nutrients are passively translocated in this 
apoplastic continuum between the partners. Interesting is that underneath the hydrophobic surface coat, we have a fungal wall area with glucans, especially lichenine was detected in this area, which is very uh, easily hydrated. Fortunately, cryotechniques became available in electron microscopy. These allowed to locate water in the thallus and to explore the fate of mycobiont and photobiont cells during desiccation and rehydration. Specimens are shock frozen at any level of hydration in either subcool propane for free substitution and ultra thin sectioning for TEM investigations or in liquid nitrogen for low temperature scanning electron microscopy um, investigations. You can see here, under drought stress, the algal and the fungal cells are shriveled. The fungal cells even implode, they cavitate, but when water becomes available, the both partners regain their shape and dimensions as normally is seen in the fully hydrated state. And as you can see in these micrographs, there is no water which would be uh, locking the saline interior. In this uh, section of the mycobiont hyphae of Cetraria islandica, all these micrographs are from this species, you can see the hydrophobic surface li lining as a very thin coat and inside this area is the lichenine containing outer wall layer of the fungus, this tiny electron dense dot uh, referred to antibody binding in an antibody against lichenine. The inner wall is thinner in this uh, zone of the thallus. Ingrid Perne, scientific illustrator, carefully visualized the shrinking and swelling effects of Heltigera aftosa in the fully hydrated and the desiccated state. This visualization was made after many sessions at the cryo low temperature scanning electron microscope. <clears throat> Desiccated lichens tolerate, tolerate temperature extremes. Here you see fragments of Xanthoria parietina, which have been shock frozen, freeze fractured under high vacuum conditions and examined under the electron beam in the low temperature scanning electron microscope, then pasted on new supporting structures, incubated outdoors, and you see they were growing normally after several months. Fully hydrated specimens did not survive this harsh treatment the membrane damage was too big. Otto Ludwig Lange, renowned ecophysiologist of the University of Würzburg, and his team had developed sophisticated equipment for gas exchange measurements in plant and lichens, especially under extreme field conditions. They reported a water depression of photosynthesis, no gas exchange being measurable at high levels of hydration in the thalline exterior. So 
uh, gas exchange is, me is measured outside the lichen thallus. Lichen thalli were assumed to become waterlogged, which prevents gas exchange and photosynthesis of algal cells. I could hardly believe that lichens are so poorly designed that photosynthesis should not be possible in fully hydrated thalli whose peripheral cortical layer is translucent for light in the fully hydrated state, but more or less opaque during drought stress events. In such a lichen, the mycobiont amounts to more than 80% of thalline biomass. Its respiration should provide enough CO2 for algal photosynthesis. I therefore speculated that fully hydrated lichen thalli may resemble little bottle gardens, whose external CO2 content remains unchanged while the photoautotrophic inhabitants are photosynthetically active. Burkhard Schröter measured the photochemical efficiency of photosystem 2 in the green algal and cyanobacterial photobionts of Placopsis contour duplicata at different levels of hydration in the maritime Antarctic. The electron flow through photosystem 2 was highest in both photobionts when the thallus was so saturated with liquid water. Recently, Marie-Claire Ten Welthuis and colleagues measured electron transport by oximetry in fully hydrated discs of Flavoparmelia caperata, which were inserted in microcuvette. They showed that fungal respiratory CO2 is taken up by the green algal partner and photosynthetic O2 by the mycobiont. If we look carefully at lichens in the microscope, we recognize not only the fungal hyphae, as you can see here, but also endolichenic fungi, this one even with clamp connection, uh, like uh, the Sidiomycet, and bacteria on the surfaces of this medullary hyphae. Bacteria are ubiquitous on lichen surfaces, for example here on the upper cortex and the lower cortex of Parmelia sulcata. Even in light in transmission electron microscopy sections, you recognize that there are different, sorry, different types of bacterial cells, probably taxonomically diverse. Uh, species present. Lichens are not dual or triple symbiosis, but there are lots of bacterial and fungal epi and endobionts, parasitic lichens, lichenicolous and some symptom loss endolichenic species, the so-called microbiome of lichens. David Hawksworth was the first to point this immense diversity in his important 1988 paper on the variety of fungal algal symbiosis, their evolutionary significance and the nature of lichens. Considering the numerous bacterial uh, partners of lichen thalli, I defined lichens as a consortium with an unknown number of participants. Elizabeth Arnold and colleagues consider lichens 
as cradles of symbiotrophic fungal diversification, a very interesting approach. Now, Martin Grube and his team investigate lichen bacterial interactions uh, with lots of success. There is a very nice review in the Mycota series. And Grube and Hawksworth recently redefined lichens as complex ecosystem. Viruses were found in lichens, in the photobiome, and in endolichenic fungi. So many teams worldwide investigate endolichenic fungi and bacteria as regards to biodiversity, to the potential biological roles for lichen symbiosis. The main problem is lichens cannot yet be routinely cultured under sterile conditions, and this would be essential for the exact definition of impact of this endolichenic fungi and bacterial endobionts of the thalli. There is an intense search for bioactive compounds such as antibiotic, anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer compounds. A nice review was published by Parrot and colleagues on lichen-associated bacteria as a hotspot of chemodiversity. Now, horizontal gene transfer between the symbionts, a very interesting uh, field for research. Uh, Daniele Armaleo recently uh, published a paper on the genome of uh, the Quadonia grey symbiosis with a viral uh, inhabitant of the Astrochloris photobiont. Now, how old is lichen symbiosis? The fossil record of fungi in general and of lichens in particular is very scarce. Fungal hyphae and thalli are biodegradable and thus hardly ever are preserved in situ. Yuan and colleagues describe approximately 600 million years old lichen-like fossils in phosphorites of the marine Taoshan Duo formation. However, the presumed hyphae in contact with unicellular cells, presumably cyanobacterial mats, have diameter below one micron and therefore are, act are actinobacteria rather than fungi. Best preserved, of course, are lichens in amber. 163 species have so far been described. These amber inclusions look very pretty, and um, there are, is a large body of, of published literature by George Poinar, Yuko Rikinen, Ulla Kasalainen, Alexander Schmidt. Look at this beautiful Soretiet lichen, which was described by Hartl and colleagues. And in a cross fracture of this uh, thallus, which is embedded in, in the amber resin, they could even visualize the algal layer and the contacting hyphae. Like even like Nicholas fungi are retained in amber specimens. You can see the same type of like Nicholas fungus in the fossil and in extant resin of 
agathis uh, species in New Caledonia. Or look at this beautiful uh, Lycanicholus fungi on crustose lichens uh, here, sporidesmium like species or a Taniolella like fungus on crustose lichens in amber. So there is um, there are interesting publications by Ketun and, and colleagues, and so this uh, example is from Sapkowski and colleagues. My favorite lichen, of course, among in the fossil record is Honeckeriella complexa, which is about 100 million years older than the amber fossils. It was described by Matsunaga, Stocki and Tomescu in, in 2013. This is a surface peel in the light microscope and a fractured part in scanning electron microscopy. These cross uh, sections are very well comparable with extant lichens. Here, for example, Armelia sulcata, you see the algal layer, the upper cortex, the lower cortex, and the medullary layer. <coughs> Sorry. Same here. Comparison with the extant Armelia. And also the microbiont, photobiont is very well visible here, as you can see. And even the interface of both partners <coughs> suggests that this is probably the same type of haustorial structure as we are used to see, for example, in uh, Extant Parmeliaceae, here the example of Hypopinia fissotis. Now, it was a very great pleasure and really a privilege to collaborate with Diane Edwards, internationally renowned paleobotanist of the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at Cardiff University. I have met her after my retirement. And her co-workers, together we worked on fossil lichens <coughs> as recovered from early Devonian sandstones, approximately 415 million years old in the Welsh borderland. This material <coughs> was not preserved in situ, but ended up as small fragments in fluvial sediments after charcoalification during wildfires. <coughs> These images show that wildfires, sorry, develop not only in forests, <coughs> but also in Arctic tundras and can have impressive, impressive dimensions. Here in the Siberian steppe and here in the Arctic tundra. And in the recent summer, we saw these horrifying images of the big wildfires in Siberia. <coughs> now, when enough oxygen is available during the firing at high temperature, you have only ashes left, which um, re reveal little or no structural preservation. But when oxygen is low, a low content at high firing temperature, 
the specimens are charcoalifying or charring. And there you have a, a surprisingly good uh, specimen preservation. Millions of years later, when these fragments, charcoalified fragments, have been transported by wind and rain into fluvial and uh, coastal sediments, millions later you can detect them in uh, sedimentary rocks. Here is an example of a uh, sandstone from the Walsh area in Alsace next to the Strasbourg Cathedral. And this monument in honor of stonemasons past and present who have been working at this cathedral contains in this area here lots of tiny charcoalified fragments this is the type of fossils we have been looking at. And ever since I have met Diane Edwards and Lindsay Axe, her co-worker, I cannot, um, I cannot um, pass a sandstone without looking if I could not see tiny uh, mini crumbs of presumed fossils. Now, these fossil mini crumbs, as I call them, which were extracted from fluvial sediments of the Lower Devonian in the Welsh borderland, were deposited ex situ far from the original habitat. Their terrestrial origin is easily recognizable due to the charring. This is the difference to fossil freshwater organisms. Fishes were uh, contained uh, in a sedimental layer above this uh, zone where the mini crumbs had been recovered, which we investigated. These fragments are not compressed. They reveal excellent structural preservation and are ideally suited for scanning electron microscopy investigations. They are small, less than one, rarely more than three millimeters, and represent only minute fragments from larger organisms. Lindsay Axe is the expert in SEM preparation and imaging of fossil mini crumbs. There are hundreds of them and there would be lots of work for many years to analyze all of them and investigate. <coughs> but this is the material which we are used to look at. Two lichens were detected. One is a cyanobacterial lichen with Kreisschnitt cyanolichenomycites demonicus, as you can see here. A detail of this area shows a cortical layer and a photobiont layer underneath with gelatinous sheaths and only few cyanobacterial photobionts have been retained. Most of them have been lost during the charcoalification event. But you can see, for example, the hole between in the gelatinous sheath of the cyanobacterial photobiont, the hole between adjacent uh, cyanobacterial cells. For comparison, we have the same situation here in extant uh, Pelticera. Sayero Lichenomycites devonicus uh, comprises a uh, pycnidium. 
which was probably filled with mucilage in the lifetime of this lichen. And inside this cavity, you can see the conidial cells developing on conidiophores. For comparison, extant lobaria virens <coughs> with a pycnidium, where you see microconidial masses oozing out of the osteol, and from the lower side you can see this uh, pycnidium as a almost globose um, structure comparable to the situation here in this fossil. And in the electron micrograph, you can see um, of the extant specimen, you can see the conidial cells growing out of the conidial pore. Quite similar to the situation here. Now, now to be sure that our interpretation of this photobiont layer is correct. We subjected extant Petigera species and also Leptogium, uh, Lichenoides and free-living Nostoc colonies to charcoalification. <coughs> and we're surprised to see that the specimens look very, very similar to our fossil sample. The cyanobacterial cells were lost. They did not survive the heat treatment. But the gelatinous sheaths are retained. And you can see these holes here between adjacent uh, cyanobacterial cells. Same situation here in Leptogium and in free living Nostoc commune. It is surprising that this gelatinous sheath resisted this treatment. It is built up by fibrillar material, as you can see here in the ultra thin section, and in an isolated uh, gelatinous sheath um, spread and replicated for electron microscopy investigations. <clears throat> the second lichen fragment is a presumed green algal lichen. The green algal cells are not retained, but instead we can see this pyrid framboids. So framboids are raspberry-like structures. And only seldom was the algal cell wall retained, as, as you can see here in this situation, in very co close contact with the fungal hyphae. And for comparison, uh, extant Sartoria parietina. Now, in this uh, Chlorolichenomycite salopensis, there were, were lots of bacterial epibionts on the surface of the cortex, as you can see here, here. in comparison with extant <coughs> Parmelia sulcata, the upper and lower cortical surfaces. Inside this fossil like in fragment. We can see the mycobiont, this thick hyphae here, and in contact with them are fungal hyphae of an endolichenic uh, fungus. Another one is here. And lots of actinobacterial filaments can be seen here. Lots of them and the uh, endolichenic fungus, as you can see here. So, when I saw these actinobacterial filaments, I was very excited because <coughs> they reminded me of the publication of Imke Schmidt and Thorsten Lunch 
who showed that polyketide synthase genes, the tools for secondary metabolism, were most likely horizontally transferred from actinobacteria to the ancestors of lichen-forming actomycetes. Now, cyanolichenomycetes and chlorolichenomycetes strongly resemble extant lecanoromycetes. However, Matthew Nelson and colleagues conclude from their thorough analysis of time-calibrated phylogenies of extant lichen-forming axomycetes that lecanoromycetes were not present in the early Devonian. We have to keep in mind that the calibration of the molecular clock is a matter of debate, and lichenization was repeatedly gained and lost during evolution. Lots of other fungal fossils from the late Silurian to early Devonian, such as the possibly lichenized nematophytes, nematosketum, or the enigmatic genus Prototaxites, belong to extinct phyla. Irrespective of their taxonomic affiliation, chlorolichenomycetes and cyanolichenomycetes are lichenized fungi, which prove that lichenization, the lichen lifestyle, is a more than 400 million years success story. <clears throat> my thanks go to my bosses and directors of the Institute, Hans Rudolf Hall, who allowed me to do my own research projects and Uli Grosny Klaus who inherited me after Hans Ruth's um, retirement and also allowed me to continue the director of the Institute of Plant Biology is a wheat geneticist. I cannot show images of all my collaborators during my 30 years, 33 years at the Institute. It was a very great pleasure to explore lichen symbiosis with so many talented and nice young people. So these are memories of a very happy professional life. Ursi auch kept the scanning electron microscope functional and Jean-Jacques Pitek, a skillful and multi-talented engineer, kept the transmission electron microscope functional and was very helpful in many other uh, respects. <clears throat> a cordial thank you goes to Arturo Polanos and Stefan Roffler, IT supporters at the Institute of Plant and Microbial uh, microbial biology of the University of Zurich. They were my Zoom teachers and very patient. I mean, I could be her grandmother. So now, dear friends and colleagues, thank you for your interest and attention and good luck and lots of satisfaction in your research. Thank you very much, Rosemary. I don't know if I just wish you could see everybody because there would be an absolute roar of applause and a lot of smiling faces and people's hands being very tired from writing notes because what a lot of fantastic information was covered there. So thank you for a fantastic talk. I'm going to turn uh, the program over to Professor Peter Crittenden, recently retired from Nottingham, to do our question and answer series. Um, for you. And so if, if Peter and Rosemary, can you can turn your videos back on now and we'll start the question and answer uh, phase of this program. So I know there's some questions that have come in already. Please continue to ask those. Um, so I'll, we'll get 
everybody to turn their video, not everybody, but Peter and Rosemary, if you could please turn your videos on and then I'll disappear. I can't turn my video on because it says that it's been stopped. So yes. probably Helene needs to put it on. Okay, we'll work on that. Oh no, it's now, it's okay. Thanks very much. Great, okay, here we go. Okay, so, th thank you, thank Rosemary, you for a fantastic uh, talk. Um, questions are coming in. There, there is a question uh, which is quite specific. I'll ask it in a minute, but uh, so maybe I'll just kick off and ask you a very general one. It's probably quite difficult to answer, but see how you go. You talked about David Smith, a mentor. Um, he was a, um, an expert in uh, physiology. He used radioisotopes and chromatography and then came um, the techniques of electron microscopy in which you were in the vanguard of that. Um, and following from that, there came genomics. And I know you've contributed in a, a major way to, to, to genomics as well as electron microscopy. Um, would you like to speculate, is there another revolution coming? Or do you think when we know how the entire genome is expressed and what it does, that's it, we've arrived? Or is there another revolution? Well, yeah, that's yeah. Difficult. It's difficult to say, but um, I mean, uh, the more genetic information is available, the more will people go into depth of this symbiosis. And I think the question about horizontal gene transfer will be uh, an important topic in, in near future, because this is an element in evolution which could not be investigated so far because no tools were available. And you know, when I, um, many of you may have thought, why does she tell these old stories? But I thought the young generation like enologists who grew up with um, sequencing uh, are not familiar with this type of data, but it was such a great pleasure to, to do this electron microscopy studies. I really enjoyed because it's also a very aesthetic uh, uh, technique and the results. And so maybe the most institutes have uh, no electron microscopy units anymore because it costs lots of money to maintain them. Everybody is now sequencing and analyzing uh, sequence data and so on. But it could be that when enough sequence data are available that some people are going back to ultrastructural studies when it it comes to questions where are genes expressed and, and so on. But in near future, I think it will probably be um, big efforts to study horizontal gene transfer between symbionts, not only in lichen symbiosis, but also elsewhere. And especially in Asian uh, countries is, are lots of efforts done to uh, isolate potentially economically uh, useful compounds. So. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, so um, Carlos Villarreal has a qu quite specific uh, questions for you. Um, he thanks you for your talk. He says, uh, um, I'm new to lichenology and I have two questions. One, I wonder whether you have seen changes in paranoid morphology in populations of green algae across different fungal partners. And the second question is, have you seen any evidence of yeast, for example, basidiomycete to yeast or, or others in fossil lichens? Yeah, the first question with the pyrenoids, you know, they, they are characteristic of um, Trebuxias and Cocomuxa and Chlorella species. And I cannot say that I would have seen any changes from free living to symbiotic state. They are just there, but we never looked at it more carefully. And um, the other point was um, have you seen any evidence of yeast, 
Basidiomycetes or others in fossil lichens? You know, the yeast and um, yeast story is, is um, currently discussed very intensely and the potential role of these yeasts which have been detected. Uh, it would be good to have an experimental system where one could really investigate what these yeasts are actually doing on this like this. But, you know, we have two small fragments of fossil lichens in the early Devonian and um, this uh, relatively small fragment of Honeckeriella. And um, there, I saw no evidence of something like a yeast, but we can also, I mean, these are precious holotypes which we cannot just dissect and and destroy, so to say, um, in search of such structures. We, I can simply say I didn't see anything the like. Okay. Um, Gothami Wirakuna is asking, how many mini crumbs did you uh, get to look at in your studies? The mini crumbs, you know, you saw this petri dish with a recovery of one preparation and you saw Lindsay Axe who did the preparation of the mini crumbs and she did the pre-selection, you know, she, she um, mounted the mini crumbs on same space stops and investigated them just um, was looking over and took photos and I then got such photos and could decide which ones are worth for a for an intense investigation and Lindsay of course and Diane have looked at hundreds of mini crumbs and you know the type specimens are then um, the tiny tiny uh, crumbs which are on the stop for the scanning microscope. They are not uh, contained in a, in a herbarium bag, but this, these are the type specimens. And Lindsay is very skillful. Uh, for example, she takes the mini crumbs which have been uh, photographed on one side of the stop turns it around, sticks it to a new, to a new um, stop and looks at it from the lower side. And then um, this is very precious and rare material. When, when you have an interesting specimen, uh, this is then uh, quite, quite exciting. But among these large amounts of mini crumbs, which have been photographed in the Cardiff lab. I, I saw only two, the two specimens which I now describe. But there are lots of other, I mean, these nematophytes, which probably could have been lichens, which have lost their photobionts during charcoalification. And we have seen that this is well possible that photobionts do not survive the charring uh, event. There is lots of work to be done as well in this area. Okay, I've got an, an, another question from Paul Cannon. Um, there have been some speculations lately, or not so lately, but a little while ago, that uh, lichenized fungi farm algae rather than there, than there being a truly mutual relationship. Uh, can you say anything about this? I assume this is the Trevor Goward um, um, thinking. Can you repeat? Yes, I beg, I beg your pardon. There have been there have been some speculations lately that lichenized fungi farm algae. It's the Trevor Goward, you know, that uh, it uh, lichenized fungi are fungi that have discovered agriculture. That's what Trevor Goward. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, proposed. yeah. The and, uh, so, and uh, Paul asks. Um, uh, can you say anything about this? What's your view of this idea? Yeah, you know, years before Trevor's uh, farming hypothesis, I was talking about these um, bottle gardens. And indeed, I think the 
lichenforming fungi are some kind of um, farmers, especially those which are actively positioning the photobiont cells in the best possible position within the thallus, um, that they are well exposed to the, to the light, but also that they are at the periphery of the gas field medullary layer, which is important for gas exchange. So this farming idea is, uh, is interesting. And indeed, when you see how these haustorial complexes are growing and by doing so, position the algal cells in, in, a, in a best possible place within the thallus, then we can really say this is an active process, which, which is quite amazing, in fact. Um, I, I have more questions, but I'm aware we're getting towards the end of time. I just wonder whether th there is no more questions, I believe, in the uh, question and answer um, program I'm looking at here. I just wonder whether any other members of the panel wish to ask um, Rosemary a question. I saw one more question in the um, in the Q and A oh, did I miss earlier. One? That's okay. Um, I'm trying to find it. It was from. Oh, I th they're changing their, their location. These quick. I see. I yes, there is right. the first one. Um, do, you, do you want me to? Okay. So this comes from uh, Theo Llewellyn, who I think is a panel member. Regarding horizontal gene transfer, do you think that HGT has occurred also in the opposite direction from microbiome to microbiome species? Uh, could be, but I, I have no evidence of this. I mean, theoretically, this might perhaps be possible, especially um, maybe, yeah, the virus, the viral uh, interactions would have to be explored in, in more detail, but I cannot comment on this at the moment. Okay. Um, there is another question there, but I don't know. Um, are we out of time? Um, if, I think we can just maybe do two more questions and then we should probably call it. It's been a, um, okay. a long night and uh, I'm sure people need to get on. Okay, so uh, this comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, I haven't read it yet, so I hope it's polite. It says, in terms of lichen reproduction, how big do you think lichen populations can be? Are they global, continental? Does it depend on the species? Yeah, um, is the question about reproduction or, or? Yes, in terms of lichen reproduction, how big do you think lichen populations can be? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, I, I have one example at hand, and this is Xanthoria parietina. You know, this is a, an extremely successful lichen. It, is, um, it tolerates high nitrogen and, and even air pollution, and it is um, homothallic, so it doesn't need a, a mating partner to produce um, ascospores, it can form ascospores uh, just by itself. And it is a very tough species and uh, we have made some investigations about the genetic diversity of uh, Xanthoria parietina over wide uh, areas. We have been asking friends and colleagues to collect and on their trips and to, to bring back home. And so we could even show that uh, Xanthoria parietina came to Australia, possibly uh, on cuttings of wine grape um, twigs. And it is very successful. You find lots of them uh, around wineries in in Australia, it is in California. So this is an example of a, of a species which is widespread. And also Xanthoria elegans is, is the species where people always come and tell me 
you don't believe what pretty lichens I have seen in the Himalayas and so on. And um, I then say, look, um, outdoors on this wall there, this is Santoria elegans, which you, which you can find here as well. But there are, of course, lots of lots of lichen species with a very low area of distribution. They are possibly not very competitive. They need special requirements. Um, most of the members here know this better than what I do. But um, these are the two extremes. In some species, you have only a very, very small area of distribution. And the reasons are often not so clear why, why this is so. But they are not uh, competitive. And, and these are the endangered species which might disappear if, if uh, their area is getting smaller and smaller, uh, for example, by habitat destruction or so.